And here we go. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Mary Pearson. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Pearson. I am currently a recreation therapist and certified dementia practitioner at Sharon Hospital on their geriatric psychiatry unit. It's a 17 bed unit specifically geared towards people over the age of 55 who experience mental health concerns ranging anywhere from people who have dementia to people who are working through schizophrenia and bipolar disease. So we see a little bit of it all. We have had quite the year as many of us have and something that is near and dear to my heart is compassion fatigue. It's, we're gonna talk about it, right? It has been a year. We need to address what's going on in our world and we need to address our staff and how to support them as they process the last 17 months. So I have been researching, reading, delving into full heartedly this idea of compassion fatigue, what it is, why it matters, and what we're gonna do about it as we move forward. Today, we are going to define burnout, compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, and all of the nuances of those concepts. We're also going to identify protective and risk factors in the development of compassion fatigue. What are our warning signs? What are the things that we can do to stave off these problems? We're also gonna identify organizational culture and how that impacts how our employees develop compassion fatigue or don't. So this topic is heavy, particularly for all of us who are working in healthcare right now. So that being said, if at any point anybody needs to take a break, needs to go step away, have a drink, do whatever you need to do, when you're ready, you come back. If you're not, that's okay safer space. You don't even have to write it in the chat. Just take a break. It's okay. We're going to try and keep it as light as humanly possible. And in that nature, I'm going to bombard you with pictures of animals and tiny humans. All right. So here's the framework of what we're talking about this evening. It's a little bit of a um, like family tree where great grandfather here is your professional quality of life. And then it splits into two. That piece is compassion satisfaction and compassion fatigue. And then under the umbrella of compassion fatigue is burnout and secondary tra traumatic stress. I'm gonna try and say that word as little as possible tonight because it never rolls off the tongue. <laughs> so <laughs> that's our theoretical framework. We're gonna go back and define each of these terms a little bit here. Professional quality of life. This is Fenway. I know the people who are here live know Fenway. Fenway was off to work, so he had to wear his little bow tie. Very profesh. So professional quality of life are all the positive and negative feelings associated with your role. It's the good, the bad, the ugly, the negative, the neutral, everything within your emotive state about your role in your agency. And then we have compassion satisfaction. This is Ted. Ted was very satisfied with the job that he had done. Me, not so much, but Ted was very satisfied. So in our roles, in our jobs, in our careers, compassion satisfaction is our feelings of doing a job well done. It's also a perspective. It is a factor in predicting how caring your employees are gonna be. So the more satisfied your employee is, the more they're gonna care. Pretty, pretty strong correlation there too. It also impacts recruitment and retention. So if you have a satisfied employee, they're gonna stick around and they're also gonna tell their friends, hey, I love this job, I love working for them. Come on down, the water's warm, right? So we wanna keep our staff as happy and as satisfied as humanly possible. So that, that's the good stuff. So compassion fatigue are the negative emotional and behavioral responses to stress in the workplace. I compare this to an onion, right? So when you are asked 
to go to that one extra meeting takes a little layer off. When you have to stay 10 minutes over two or three or four or five or seven days a week, feels a little layer off. When you're asked to run the extra program, when you're asked to do the extra role, when you are asked to just train the staff member or answer the phone, these things start to wear down, right? They're peeling off our layers and eventually it's an onion. There's not much left, right? And we're left kind of raw and exposed. And that's where we're left when we're feeling compassion fatigue. What I really wanna bring up when we talk about compassion fatigue is that during the SARS and MERS epidemics, they counted one in six people having significant stress symptoms, particularly people in healthcare, but one in six. I am guessing that number is underreported. I'm thinking that that's a lot more. So, and it's new research. Most of what I've read was from 2019, 2020. So even now that's dated research. They're coming up with stuff out of China constantly about mental health in their care workers. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what comes out from the past. But if one in six was from SARS and MERS, we can only imagine what it's going to look like for COVID. So just as we look at our staff and you walk down the hallways at your agency, you might just need to have a little bit more like oh, one in six is a lot. Okay, burnout. I don't think Fenway's ever been burnt out, but he looks a little snoo snoozy there. So burnout is prolonged response to interpersonal stressors, particularly on the job. That being said, we understand that you do not leave your job at the exit on the way out and you do not leave your home life on the entrance on the way in. So there is an interplay there. There are three dimensions to burnout. The first is emotional exhaustion, right? I am tired. I cannot listen to one more client tell me that they have a pain in their left pinky toe. I just can't do it which subsequently happened to me today, can't do it. There's also a depersonalization. Okay, I'm gonna run this group, great. Show me another client, great, moving on. Okay, what's next? Not really connecting, not really caring, not really differentiating between the people I'm working with. And of course, then there's a reduced personal accomplishment. I don't really feel like I'm making an impact. I don't really, meh. I'm not really feeling like I'm being acknowledged at work. I'm not, you know, not feeling the gold stars. The thing that's significant about burnout outside of the fact that your employee is unhappy is that it impacts outcomes. People who are burnt out have lower productivity. They have poor quality of care that they provide to their patients or their residents. They have poor quality across an entire health system. If you imagine, the more burnt out people you have, the poorer your healthcare system runs. You also have increased medical errors, right? So you're looking at, well, CTRSs don't pass meds. The risk for an error is still absolutely possible, right? And there's a lower perception of safety culture. So there's this belief that we are in the wild, wild west and it's all men for themselves and you do you and I'll do me and hopefully we you know, don't kill anybody in the process. Of note, the International Labor Organization has as of 2016 has identified burnout as a public health issue internationally. So this is a global issue that we need to start addressing. And that was pre-pandemic. So now I, you know, it's exponentially greater of an issue. So I'm going to assume that you want us to kind of contribute to the discussion as you're going, yes or no, or maybe? Yell out, talk, yeah. chat amongst, you know, feel yeah. free to contribute, tell me anecdotes, I, all good. I do want to say that I absolutely was, you were talking about how we don't have med errors, but I definitely committed a rookie mistake um, a couple of weeks ago. We had a couple of kids on quarantine because they were COVID positive and I was bringing all these supplies to them and I was like, yeah, this is great, everything's wonderful. And then the next day I come in and they say, um, did you give this child this coloring book? And I said, yeah. And they said, yeah, you didn't take the staples out. And the child self-harmed with it last night. And I was like, oh, oh my God. So yeah, so mad errors, no, but working in sight, giving a patient something to self-harm with, you know, not the smartest idea. 
No. And does it happen? Yeah. But is it more yes. likely to happen if we're tired and right? Right. right? It, it right. happens. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. okay. Right. We just. Yeah. So. Oh, no. I, yeah. Like it wasn't like anything that like became a thing, but like I felt so terrible. And I, you know, I said, oh my God, that was like, I haven't made that kind of mistake literally since I started out. Cause I'm, so, I'm usually the one telling my staff, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. And I did it. So I'm there with you. I get it. Yeah. We've all been there. Doesn't yeah. help when you're feeling burned. Right. So there's burnout. And then the other piece of our compassion fatigue is the secondary traumatic stress. So these are your intrusive emotional responses, work-related exposure to traumatized people. So you are having the response because you are working with people who experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. This, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are similar to PTSD symptoms, physiological yeah. arousal, fear, hypervigilance, anxiety, somatic symptoms like nausea, headache, body ache, intrusive reminders of the event, sleep disturbance, and avoiding the reminders of the trauma. Maybe you pass that client to somebody else, or you don't go into that room because that's where you talked about that thing. And you're like, mm, not doing that today. Mm -hmm. The difference right now is where the trauma derives. So because you are getting the traumatic event secondhand, they're considering it secondary traumatic stress. However, as of the DSM-5, they now include exposure to aversive details as part of PTSD criteria. So if you meet the other PTSD criteria and the trauma is derived from exposure to the aversive details, it is PTSD. So we're in, if it quacks like a duck and it mm -hmm. waddles like a duck, mm -hmm. why isn't it a duck? Well, we're getting to it being a duck. It's a duck. A, it's, it's a totally duck. duck. It's a duck. It's a duck. And I, yep. I think it's, we're finally moving in the right direction of saying, oh, you have a little, you know, it used to be, well, yeah, of course you're traumatized. You were exposed to these traumatic experiences, but, you know, we're going to, part of being a therapist is what you do. Right. I think we're finally naming it, you know, we're naming it to tame it. Let's call it what it is. Yeah. So we're moving in the right direction. That vicarious trauma. Yes. Right. Yeah, so very much, very much vicarious trauma, which they're now calling secondary traumatic stress. It's right. all in the literature. A lot of it is used interchangeably, and it's just mm -hmm. whatever vernacular you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So this is Ted. Oh. You have oh, to have Ted. two puppy faces when you talk about risk factors. <laughs> you are more likely to experience compassion fatigue, either in the form of burnout or secondary traumatic stress, if you are relatively young, if you have young children, if you have a low professional education level, if you have, actually, um, some studies are saying more years in the profession, some are saying less years in the profession, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later, your years with an organization. This is really interesting. Having a permanent contract. So mm -hmm. people who are permanently employed with an agency, as opposed to like a traveling nurse mm -hmm. or a traveling CTRF, are more likely to have capacity. fatigue. They think mm -hmm. it's tied to the fact that your traveler knows they're out of here, right? They just right. have to hold on for X amount of days and they're gone, as opposed to, well, this is my forever, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that makes a lot of sense. It does. It was just not a piece of the data that I had ever seen before. And I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> having a prior psychiatric history, including depression, including anxiety, mm. a prior history of trauma or negative life experiences, right? So you may have one traumatic event or you may have lots of little negative life experiences and those things compound. A lack of social support, feelings of helplessness or other strong emotions during your exposure. So if you are already yeah. having a bad day, haven't eaten breakfast, had a bad phone call, you're not setting yourself up for being a positive, you know, you're setting yourself up for exposure and having a negative effect. My hair is still wet. Sorry, y'all. I know I keep touching it. I'm, it's just <laughs> not staying still. And it, well, it's like, sorry. Um, 
if you have a lack of trauma-informed development, if you don't have training in how to deal with trauma or traumatic experiences or aversive details, you're not going to know what to do. Um, The more time, obviously, that you provide these services, the more likely you are to have compassion um, fatigue and proximity to ground zero. If you are responding to a, a specific traumatic event, the closer you are to the event, right, sensically, the more likely you are to experience compassion fatigue. Mm. And these things play into each other, right? The younger you are, in all likelihood, the less education you have. The younger you are, potentially you're going to have a younger family, right? And yeah, right? All round and around and around you go. We can't, we can't just think of people as unilateral, right? Yeah. It's almost like (laughs) you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. It's any way you look at it, any way you slice it, new to the profession, you've been in the field 25 years or more. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I just presented on, you know, trauma-informed care and dealing with difficult topics. And like, this is absolutely, it's, it's, that's what trauma-informed care is all about. It's figuring out how to help somebody, even the staff. And that's super important. Right. Sometimes we forget that the people yeah. providing care are human and they come with these things, right? right? Or other things. So just, yeah, being aware. Yeah. One thing I, I want to, go ahead. Um, so I did want to just briefly mention gender because a lot of times when we talk about people who experience stress, right, we're like, oh, it's women. Yeah. This is always women. A meta analysis recently looked at that specifically in nurses, not, um, there's not a lot of TR research, right? So shocking. (laughs) I'm (laughs) preaching to the choir, but there's not a lot of TR research. So I looked at nurses. They actually found that it was a 50-50 split between men and women. In fact, some of the research pointed more towards men. Hmm. It's how you look at the data and how you ask the questions because men and women are not always likely to answer in the same ways. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's being smart in your study. Yeah. So well, well, let's um, talk about something a little bit more light. How are we gonna protect ourselves? Um, we're gonna have support from our organizations. We're gonna have support from our supervisors and our colleagues and our peers. We're gonna get trained. <laughs> I'm gonna say it again, we're gonna get trained. <laughs> And we're gonna have pre-existing coping skills, positive coping skills. So Cal using his good coping skills, rocking the horticulture, helping me with the garden. <laughs> um, he probably ate more of that dirt than he put in the bucket, but you know, <laughs> he was- It grows immunity, right? The immunity. Yeah. It does, and it was a preferred interest and there was safety protocols involved, so it's okay. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, this kid has no chance. It's a poor guy. So we're so when we talk about support, we're kind of talking about three different specific areas. The first is appraisal. So you're feeling like you're getting feedback. You're getting both formal and informal conversations with a supervisor. You're getting feedback, and you feel like there's people like looking out for you and kind of promoting your growth. You feel like you belong, right? So you feel like you're part of the team, you're on board, you know that you're one with the group. And then Mm -hmm. tangible support. So belonging, right? Touchy feely, I belong, right? And opposed to tangible support, when I look around on the floor and things are hitting the fan, I can take a moment and go, oh, there's someone, I'm good. I've got a physical support right here with me. So as we think about our agencies and our practices, when we look around our milieus, are those things available, not only for ourselves, but also for the people that we're we're working with? If you look around, are you the only one in your day room? If, (laughs) yes, yes, all the time, right? All the time. Yeah. That one's one of the ones that really struck me of like, yeah, I don't always know if I have a tangible support, maybe outside, right but not always in the room with me yeah 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 like you when know you're in psych you really should be having additional support when you're in psych i i always tell my staff i don't want you ever alone with 
anybody because it's you never know. So no, no, uh, you never know, right? It even with my elder adults, you never right? know. So or Susie's elder adults, right? Like you don't know. Right. You know what what appears to be a sweet little old man, he can right. flip flip a switch as quick as anything and mm -hmm. become a terminator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right? That that strength thing. Ooh. Yeah. So um the physical support was something I, that definitely kind of struck me. The belonging, I think there's something just generic about the nature of our work that we always kind of feel like we're in this together thing, mm -hmm. or at least I have felt that experience. And then appraisals hit or miss, right? Wherever you are. Yeah. Yeah. So then we've got, I'm calling them the big three. Um, this is Cal showing us some um, grit, a little bit of perseverance. He would not go under that fence for anything. <laughs> it was over or bust. The stick that he wanted was about three inches away from his hand. And the only <laughs> way to get to that stick was to go over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Problem solving. Yes. So, <laughs> so our other protective factors, resilience. So there's a plethora of research now about resilience. This is adapting well in the face of stress. How do you bend and weave and flex as stressful situations come your way? Grit, um, Angela Duckworth developed the term grit. She is definitely one of like the forerunners in this field, definitely lots of great research. She's also on a podcast with the guy who did Freakonomics, which is very funny. It's like something like no stupid questions or ask me a stupid question, highly recommend, really great but talking about grit. So this passion and perseverance for long-term meaningful goals. Can you sink your teeth in and hold on for the long run? Can you sprint out the marathon? The three big components of grit, of course, are diligence, determination, and that goal setting. I will say for people who have a high tendency to have grit, they are now looking at that. Right now it all looks good there were, a, I think, one study that I read that they were starting to see if you don't, if you have so much grit that you don't know when to stop or when you don't know how to ask for more resources, that mm -hmm. that can possibly be not a great thing. You need to yeah. have balance, right? And we all know that person, right, who just keeps going. Mm -hmm. Would that be like the person that like, I'll do it all, I don't need any help kind of thing? Or is that more like, so when we're talking about grit, this is like the person who is driven on your team, who like wants to be really successful and do a really great job and isn't necessarily, uh, grit often has a lot to do with intrinsic motivation okay. as opposed to extrinsic motivation. Right, right. So they really want to do well, but sometimes they're pushing themselves so hard to do really well, particularly in the face of something like a pandemic. Right. Where they need, you need to take a break. It's a marathon, right? So right. you need to take a break. And that's, so knowing and identifying those people in your communities is definitely important so that you can help them maybe, you know, take a longer, less steep path. Right. So like the staff member who hasn't taken vacation time in over 12 months, you might suggest to them that you need to take a long weekend yeah. Or yeah. just schedule them for a long weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so and so has decided to take come in on Friday. What are you gonna do with that extra time? Yeah. Yep. Here's the brochure to the spa that I found five minutes from your home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a gift card. And a gift card because I love you and I love that you're on my team. Can you be my boss? Because <laughs> <laughs> yes and so the last term is psychological flexibility so this is very important this is your ability to cope with the life challenges around you externally while balancing your internal stressors so how are we dealing with 
the angry patient in front of us, how are we dealing with, you know, the family member who is having an outburst in front of us, an emotional reaction in front of us, Mm -hmm. while balancing what we're feeling inside? Because obviously we're having a lot of feelings about the angry patient in front of us, but professionally we would like to keep our job, right? So how do we balance those two things? Use our coping skills. Yes. Use our coping skills. Yes, right? Breathe. I had so to... here's, my, here's my pal, Andrew. I'm going to admit to you both now that um, I wrote these fairly late at night. So they are a little funny, <laughs> but they're also, they're pretty good. I read them the next day to make sure that they were appropriate and they're okay. <laughs> so Andrew here, I'm just going to minimize you all. There we go. Andrew is 40 and has been a CTRS for 15 years. He's been working with DAH Medical Center for 10. He works on the inpatient psych unit, working primarily with adults. Most of his patients have experienced homelessness. Andrew feels a special connection to his job because as a child, he also experienced homelessness and finds his career a way to give back. Andrew's boss works on the fourth floor and almost never comes to visit his unit. Andrew's last performance review was in 2012. Andrew lives with his grandmother and cat, Cecil. Andrew has always dreamed of opening his own wilderness therapy program and just got back from a 10-day training about facilitating wilderness interventions in hospital settings. On his days off, oh, I went from Andrew to Arthur. On his days off, Andrew <laughs> frequently takes his grandmother shopping and to doctor's appointments. Oh. Oh. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh. So talk to me about Andrew. What are some of Andrew's potential risk factors? He's been in the permanent situation for 10 years. Yep. He's been around for a long time. He has trauma. A trauma does. history. Yep. Trauma history. Oh, yeah, definitely. He doesn't have a supportive boss, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. He hasn't had a performance review in nine years year? that's insane it's bad yeah. it's really bad um yeah so he's not getting any kind of appraisal his no. boss is on the fourth floor nope could not care less he's he's an island um lives with grandma and his cat and grandma is i'm sure wonderful and his cat i'm sure is wonderful however they can't always yeah be everything it's a, yeah he it's a small small community yeah he doesn't have anyone his own age it sounds like um in terms of partner or companion yeah. or friends or social no, circle grandma's taken or... a lot of a lot of time yeah, yeah during his yeah. leisure time yes no and leisure not, time. That's the pessimist but grandma's gonna probably not gonna be around much longer what's he gonna do after that his whole yeah. life right upside down. andrew is 40 yeah so, yeah right so grandma uh, it, let's let's be nice and say maybe she's 75 maybe right. and i'm saying like probably much older so right yeah she very well could be yeah. So grandma probably has a lot of needs. She's not gonna be yeah. Not poor Andrew. He's got a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah, I mean he's taking her to doctor's appointments on his days off frequently. Yeah. So yeah. poor guy. So grandma's either quite ill or something. I mean Andrew is is quite dependent on being her end all be all. Yeah. And possibly a little bit of a co codependent situation going on possibly we don't who knows what protects andrew what are his protective factors well he has goals because he has a dream of opening up his own wilderness right yep. and he went to a training so he likes to do continuing education and actually like is motivated to improve the lives of his patients and his facility yeah so training's twofold right just training hopefully, and it's wilderness therapy. So my hope is that he's getting a little bit of trauma-informed care in there. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like he's got a little bit of grit because he's still, he's been with his current agency for 10 years, but he's still looking at the dream of opening up his own. So I'm hoping there's some grit. Um, boy, boy, oh boy. So Andrew needs some coping skills. Yeah. Andrew, he sure he does. Cat. 
Let's be honest, the cat can be a good coping skill that that it's carries. true. Yes. That's, that's true. I think I'm Susan and I are a little, probably a little biased because we're mostly dog people. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cecil, Cecil is definitely a point of comfort. You're absolutely right. You know, Kit Kat will say something over there, but uh just saying. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just make it global pets. <laughs> yes, animals. <laughs> yes. So We'll leave Andrew. Hopefully he's doing okay. This is Charlene. She works at the same agency. She's 27. She is a recent employee, recent hire. She's a rec therapy assistant. She floats between two units, working with patients who have had spinal cord injury and patients who recently have had a stroke. Her manager is a CPRS on the post-stroke unit and has scheduled a monthly meeting with her to check in and discuss goals. Charlene lives with her wife, Sarah, and their two kids, Arthur, who is three, and Anne, who is 10 months. Aww. On the weekends, Charlene and her family enjoy hiking and going to Arthur's peewee soccer games. So what are we worried about? What are Charlene's risk factors? Wow. All right. Risk factors. Um, she's new to, at least to the agency. I don't know if she's new to the field, but She's 27, so even if she's been in the field seven years, that's still new. Yeah, right. I still consider myself a rookie, right? I mean, really. So, right. She, and she's 27, so she's not young. She's not super young, but, you know, she's not filing for retirement any time soon. Right, certainly. Right. Um. She has young children, two of them. Yep, and they're little. They're like little, little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's her name? Anne, ten months old. That's that's little yet. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Not sleeping well. That's right. No. <laughs> Mary's like, no, no, she's not. No, no. she's not. And Cal is almost two, and we don't have every night as a sleep through the night kind of night. So, yeah. So yeah, so that's going on. The other thing I would point out is that she bounces between two units. Yeah, I was gonna yes. say that. Yes, absolutely. She doesn't um, have a like, home base. Yeah, she doesn't have a home base. There's no structure for her where she is. So that can be a little bit disorienting, certainly. We've all kind of been the right, been there, do two jobs. Oh, yeah. Kind of a thing. What protects Charlene? What's she got going for? She has a supportive manager. Who yes. does a check in with her, discusses goals. Obviously, she cares enough about her as an employee to want to have her succeed in these goals and you know, does it like a care plan with her basically. Like yeah. Right. Yeah. Her boss is on it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I wish my boss talked to me once a month to see how I was doing. Right. <laughs> really? Most it of sounds the like <laughs> Like it sounds like you. Charlene's got support at home, her wife, Sarah, and, yeah. you know, I know we already mentioned their two children, they're young, but, but they can be active. Absolutely. Between peewee soccer and hiking and, and then just every day, you know, up, down, keeping a house going, all of that. Um, yes. I'm sure Charlene has great cardiovascular health. <laughs> I am sure. So yeah, she's got right a little bit more of a balance here. She's definitely got some risk factors, but as far she also has a lot of protective factors, right? She's got a family, they're mm -hmm. around, she's got a partner, all good things. Okay, so let's talk about some organizational risk factors. <sighs> Check them off when you feel them. So careers where you manage critical situations if you care for traumatized people, if you witness death or serious injury. <laughs> Susie and I were like, hand raise. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? How more perfect of a crew to have on this live session. Right? <laughs> if you work in a crowded session or if you have interrupted circadian rhythms due to shift work. Yep, <laughs> triple him. Yeah. yeah, right? So that's, that's a lot of us in this field, right? I, almost all of us. I mean, I don't know if you watched Susan's, well, yeah, you both watched 
students yep. welcome, right? The picture of that one CTRS in what looks like an ICU in full yeah. PPE yeah. had, you know, had my heart in my throat, right? We, mm -hmm. especially right now, we're experiencing a lot of these things and not as one offs. This yeah. is the day to day. Yeah. And this is organization wide. It's not just, you know, CTRSs or one CTRS. It's the entire unit, it's the entire community. Yeah. It's Perfect. everybody everywhere. Yeah. Every day of our first outbreak, we had a, a month long outbreak where 70% of our patients wound up having COVID. We only had 10 kids, but seven kids got COVID. So every day when I was going to the COVID unit to do the stuff, Afterwards, I would take a picture of my face after I had the 95 of the different indents and the different lines and everything. And in my phone, I have like a succession of my face being like, and then I'm like, and then I'm mad. And then like, it's just, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you kept a record though, because I think we will want to reflect on those things when that's we're in I, yeah. a further yeah. headspace, right? Yes. You know, I in did the wanna... beginning, it was, oh, schools are going to be closed for one week. Yeah. And then it was one more week, two weeks, and we'll be through this. Yep. And, and then, then it was, oh, my gosh, there's no traffic. It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because as everybody was sitting on couches, we were still driving to work. Yeah. 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 And um, not working only our normal shift right? One of our colleagues posted the other day on Facebook something really, she hadn't shared her journey through the whole thing. She kind of like shared from the beginning in one felt swoop. And she talked about the fact that she would work in the morning. She would do her normal shift. She'd sleep in, in her office for a couple hours, wake up, do an overnight because they yeah. didn't have enough staff to help, mm -hmm. go home, sleep for eight hours, come back, do an afternoon oh and go God. over and over and over again. Oh right. And you just, she's not alone. Right. I mean, yeah. if one person is discussing it, how many people are living it? So yeah, absolutely. And yep. that messes with your hormones. It messes with, you know, your metabolic state to be mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, which of course we know raises our stress hormone cortisol and messes with mm -hmm. our blood pressure and our heart rate and yeah. oh, lots of stuff. So death and of course leading to eventually compassion fatigue and burnout. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. okay. Uh, we brought it back down. We're going to bring it back up. I promise. The other factors here are macho culture, um, that devaluing emotional vulnerability. So when people are, we don't talk about it, we're not doing it. Yep. Stigmatizing ill mental health, right? We were starting to get away from that, but there was a time when the culture said, well, we help people with mental health issues, right? Yeah. We don't have mental health issues. Without oh, no. any help, right? No, that wouldn't be us, right? Yeah. Um, we're starting to talk, right? Yeah. And the distrust and management. Right, Andrew, his boss is on the fourth floor. He does not right. trust him. Right, he does not trust his yeah. boss. He hasn't seen him since 2009 or 12 right. or whatever, right? Like that's that's just so wrong. Yeah. It's terrible. I that one was not based on real life. I hope everybody sees their manager semi-regularly. But yeah, there's sure. I'm sure there is somebody out there yeah. that has that boss. And wow. On that boss because you, you, right. need to, you need to be reaching out to your staff to make sure that they're okay too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because the facility, the organization is only as good as its yeah. staff. And if the staff are just not doing well. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, we talked about it, right? Yeah. Um, productivity. Errors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is important. And actually, Susie, you did a session talking about this a couple of years ago, right? This work-life integration piece. It's yes. not just an individual risk factor anymore. So when we talk about finding balance in our home life and our work life, what they're finding is if you have one staff member, two staff members who can't balance their home and work life, it's systematic. It's across 
it's particularly units, but it can be system wide, right? Mm -hmm. So it spreads like wildfire. Yeah, right. The oh well, I was here for fifty hours this week. Thing it trickles, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Or you know, I'm gonna work a couple extra shifts. Becomes you know, I we just went through a period where one of our units they were all like offering up overtime all the time and you feel bad right because you're short staffed but then you're burning out your current staff so how do you balance those things but it's just it's systemic right it's intrusive and it's systemic and that right so how many of us have gone into the staff lounge for a cup of coffee or a drink of water and take our n95 off for a hot minute to Mm. find the co-worker in there who's letting off steam saying such and such about so and so and whatnot and then you walk mm. out of the staff room going why do I feel like garbage now I'm at right. now I'm angry I yeah. walked in there feeling fine and now I'm angry yeah, yeah and venting culture really there is a absolutely you, uh, problems need to be addressed but that venting culture creates mm. this feeling of compassion fatigue so much more mm. the other yeah. piece about this work-life integration is that when it makes it worse, right? They, so if your work-life integration is worse, your safety culture norms are reported to be worse. So people are way less likely to be following those safety protocols, which is a little scary to think about, but true. And then this is um, to the point that we talked about a little bit last um, couple of slides ago, healthcare workers with less than six months of experience in their roles have way better work-life integration. They balance their home and work lives way better than their colleagues who have been there longer because they adapt to the culture around them, which is very, very telling. So how do we break the cycle Mm -hmm. of this poor white work life integration, particularly because we know what's happening right like we know the science and yet we allow it to continue so how do we break that cycle first we look at protective factors so when your units are structured when there is a sense of protection both a feeling of i know that if i look across the room and make eye contact with my colleague we're going to be on the same brainwave and we can do this together and we're going to make it safe but also do i have the right ppe Am I physically safe in my environment? Yeah. Yep. With, right? Yeah, I want to know that I am physically safe when I walk in the door. Yeah. There was a time, you know, I, I don't remember when, but at some point during the pandemic when there was talk of shortages of masks, yeah. shortages of gowns, possible glove shortages. Yeah. Um hand sanitizer shortages at one point there was another hospital in this area that was receiving hand sanitizer in large bulk containers and repackaging it into smaller individual you know Mm -hmm. um, regular uh eight ounce size containers right yeah yeah and they were handwriting the labels on them. And so all of a sudden we're, you know, they're seeing hand sanitizer showing up with the word alcohol misspelled on it. Oh. Doesn't really instill confidence oh. in those of us that need to use it. And like really need to use it. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh. oh. Yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah, that's very stressful. Yeah. So took a picture of that for when they digest this in a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just, that's a little thing, but it really, I'm sure that probably felt like a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And those little things add up, right? They're cumulative. So it, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the thought process there is, oh, wait a minute. What is this stuff? Why? You mean, our boss, our hospital, they, they don't care enough to buy the real stuff? What is this? Yeah. Right. So suddenly your lack of feeling like you're protected in your environment is now a mistrust of your management. Right. right? So now you've got an interplay. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. We were, there was a, the, the mask shortage. 
So we were told that we could only get one mask um, until the next, until the mask was soiled. And then we had to turn the mask in to get another mask. Yeah. And this was after I had bought my own masks before they were even mandating that we had to wear them. And then I was wearing, cause I, I got a KN95 and I'm wearing it. And they're like, no, you can't wear that. You can only wear the surgical mask. And I said, but you don't have enough. So right. why can't I use what I ordered? No, you can't use it. And so oh. luckily we were able to finally get more masks in and you know, the whole everything changed. But like in the beginning, there was just so much like, we didn't know. And then they were poo-pooing and then they were like, no, you can't. Like, it was just so frustrating. And I'm pretty sure that that absolutely goes into the, you know, organizational protective factors where like, you don't feel safe by your employer. And then you have to go home and pray to God, you're not going to bring this to anybody else. Right. That was my biggest concern, you know? Yeah. Yep. It's interesting because it's something that prior to the pandemic, many of us took for granted, right? At least the feeling like you had enough physical supplies yep. of, and how how much it changes your perception of your job as soon as some of those things are taken away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So clear communication and directives, like we just talked about that, right? So like, why can't I wear the mask that has a higher safety rating than the surgical mask? Right. Is it, right? What is the clear directive and communication there? Where, you know, um, things like visitor policy during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Changed every day. Still changes every day for me sometimes, right? So what are the rules? What are the regulations? How do I access that information? Is it being regularly distributed? Do I have to make sure I'm on a Zoom call at this time to make sure that I know the information? A little bit difficult to navigate, right? Feeling like there are precautionary measures in place, things that um, are supposed to prevent the bad scaries. Are they here? A perceived that a perceived feeling like you have enough training. So did you get your annual restraint training? Did you get your annual, you know, whatever? Do you have a support network and is there group cohesion in your unit, right? Do you have people, do you have colleagues amongst you that you feel like are gonna support you? And like I said before, if I look across the room at a colleague, do I know that there's enough cohesion between us that when we make eye contact, we're going to be on the same brain wave. Yeah. This can be facilitated through power sharing, right? My favorite example is everybody toilets everybody, right? So if somebody needs to go to the restroom, it is everyone's responsibility to help that person go to the restroom. It is not a text job or, you know, the nurses are not going to say no. Rec therapy is not going to say no. We're all going to chip in to help with that task. Do you feel like there's a partnership? And then mentoring. Whether formal or informal, do you have somebody that you can talk to for feedback who's going to guide you and help lead you in your career? This, I, I love this little nugget. It's very interesting to me. Organizational commitment. So feeling like you are committed to your group, you're here, you're holding on, is a stronger indicator that you are going to stay than job satisfaction. So do you feel like you are committed to your agency? You might not even like your job, but if you feel committed, you're more likely to stay. Mm -hmm. Good or bad. Yeah. Right, interesting. Yeah, very. Wow. So yeah. I'm not vested in my pension yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> I got three there you go. <laughs> soon, that'd be soon, right? Uh. So here are the consequences of compassion fatigue. Unlike Ted, your staff will have a lack of flexibility. They're not, they're gonna be pretty rigid. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna help cover that shift. I'm not coming in a couple hours early. This is my assigned shift. I'm gonna come and I'm gonna leave. Negative, that word, negativism towards management. I wrote this slide. I don't know why I picked words that I have a hard time saying. <laughs> Feeling like you're, management is not there for you, right? A reluctance towards change, a lack of belief that anything is 
the better is possible or there's a vision for the future. We're going to live the same day in and out. Every day we come in is the same and then we leave and we go home, right? Oy. Yeah. Boy, doesn't sound like a fun place to work, does it? No. No. It's, a, it's like Groundhog Day over and over and over. Right. Awful. Um, high absenteeism, high turnover, professional misconduct, which of course leads to ineffective services. And when we work with, this doesn't sound like a place that's very therapeutic, right? Huh. You imagine, right? This is not an office setting. This is healthcare. There are people here that we're taking care of and we need to be able to not re-traumatize people. Yeah. Right? I mean, at oh the bare minimum, the job, like, you know, the more of these things you have, of course, you're more likely you're going to re-traumatize, which is just not, not good. Sorry, this silly thing is yelling at me, and I don't know why, because it's not, it's supposed to be on silent. Okay, so here is DAH Medical Center. They are a community-based services department. So they are a community-based services. They're 15 employees, and they work with roughly 60 recently discharged patients from the inpatient hospital. So their inpatient unit discharges them and these 60 patients have now been referred to the community-based services department. The purpose of the program is to promote successful outcomes in the community environment for these folks. The employees are expected to work four 10-hour days with rotating schedules so that there are staff available from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day. Each staff member takes on call once a month overnight. Staff have a central office, but are expected to be in the field for the majority of the day. They create their own interventions and each day is different based on the needs of the client. Staff are trained once a year with few approvals for additional education. Managers touch base before JCO visits and for annual performance reviews. Staff hold a yearly picnic inviting discharged patients from the outpatient community program and their families to celebrate the year. Talk to me, what are their risk factors? Oh my goodness, so many of them. The rotating schedules, the overnights, being available 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. That's- Central office, not really. Right, they don't have a place to land. Them. Right, every day is different. Um, you know. Not there. Hmm. Yeah. They're not getting trained. Yeah, lack of training. Managers touch base before JCO visits and for annual performance reviews. So that sounds like twice a year. If that. Right. right. Yeah. If your review falls right before JCO, forget it. You're, you're a one and done. Right. Yep. Yeah, not great. What are their protective factors? What do they have going for them? Well, at least they're making sure that they rotate so that they're not completely burning them out. Yep, they're sharing, which leads me hopefully to believe that there's a sense of community within their program. I like the fact that they have the yearly picnic, that it, it brings That's... back patients and shows them that, you know, what they're doing matters. Yep, they're definitely, they're showing a little bit of, you know, fortitude, a little bit of grit, a little they, bit of celebration. They have each other, I hope. <laughs> you hope, right? There are 15 I don't know. of them. You, they also have a pretty low caseload, too. I mean, if for they're 15 like employees? Patient, for 15 employees over 60 patients, like that's not that many that you're documenting on if they are assigned. I know, I think, is... I know it's ridiculous to think about that, but that's important when you're talking about- Absolutely, you know, right? It's a low census. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So that's definitely a factor, right? How, so from an individual standpoint, right? The fact that they are working with less traumatized people less frequently, definitely helping them out. Absolutely. So However, a little bit, some things to be mindful of as we start to intervene with them. So I almost wonder if they have, if they have too small of a caseload and so then they might have boredom. Yeah. They might not feel challenged enough. Yeah. Right? I mean, 15 employees, I've never seen an, 
community-based services program with 15 employees. Right. That that's a lot of CTRSs in one. I that don't gives know. them right. Like that's like the dream. I know. A I'm, caseload of four. Right. Yeah. That's a magic magic. And thing. they're working four 10-hour days. So they have three days off to recuperate. So they've got some recreation and leisure time that's not insubstantial. Right. So it's no, possible that's, that that's a good thing. It's not often that I've heard of a rec therapist having um, a four, you know, working four tens. So I was offered that, but it was going to be specifically to benefit the facility. So it had to be um, Sunday through Wednesday. And I said, I'm not working weekends after I'm now the department head so no but mm -hmm. it, you know they we we during the pandemic they asked us all to kind of do compressed schedules if possible if it made sense um it only made sense for one of my staff to have that done um but the other ones i was like hell no i can't have them do that i need them like I'm, right there's no way so mm -hmm. yeah it's it was i work four tens now and it's magical yeah i'm sure it is it's <sighs> wonderful Three days for leisure is great. See, especially in a pandemic, you need that like little mini vacation every week to like mm -hmm. regroup yeah. so that you can come back the next week and work four tens. Yes, yeah. I definitely, I ascribe having my three day weekend. I mean, yes, I have a toddler and we're doing it for childcare, but I definitely feel like I have lasted longer feeling better Yeah, because mm -hmm. I have had more time of separation, right? And that's definitely, definitely a positive. So I think we're at least semi-familiar with a couple of these assessments, right? We, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about, I can't just bum you out and then leave you, right? We have to talk about what we're going to do as therapists. So we're going to start with assessment. Go figure. Here are our handy dandy assessments. So the first one has been around forever. This is the protocol professional quality of life. It is valid. It is reliable. It is free. It comes in a couple of different flavors, depending on what kind of place you work. And it's definitely, it's a self scored All of these assessments are self-administered. So know that as you provide them to the people that you work with or help facilitate them with the people that you work with, because of course, you know, we have um, reliability issues when people self-report. Yeah. And ProCall, of course, is only 30 items, which is very nice because it's something that's bite-sized, right? You can get that done in a staff meeting and you can collect those pretty quickly. Yes. The next one is the GRIT S scale. So this measures those three domains that we talked about, the diligence, the determination, and the other one that I'm forgetting. And it's pretty great if you're looking at how, how determined and is your staff, right? How much GRIT do you have in your community and how are you, then what are you going to do about it, right? Interpersonal support evaluation measures appraisal, belonging, and physical support. Again, a great something to do unit-wide or agency-wide to look at where your gaps are. Maslach burnout inventory has been around for a really long time. How burnt out is an individual? That being said, Maslach is now something you used to be able to get it for free. I could not find it for free on the internet this time around. I believe it was only $12.99, but it is going to be a cost for service kind of deal. And then the compassion fatigue assessment is right here. Um, it's something that I want to say this happened. This was like truly developed and researched in 2019 at the start of the pandemic. So just kind of take that for what it is. Um, it's not a bad idea, just as another resource for you. But definitely my favorite has been the ProQual. It's quick, it's easy, it gives you a good view of quality of life, including compassion, satisfaction, and compassion fatigue. Mary, there's a really cool app called Provider Resilience Ooh. that um, you can, I believe it was either developed completely or in partnership by the VA and um you know easy way to go on and just answer the questions real quick and you get your your pro qual score um pro qual score and um it's just it's kind of neat it gives you kind of like your you know speedometer of where you're at today and huh. um, i love that 
Can you yeah. put it in the chat for us? I, I will sure definitely. will. Very Anytime awesome. I can do can something you, easy. When we when we post this on YouTube, maybe we can take if you could send me just a copy of the slide, like the actual links. We can put the links into the like the description part so that people can click on it. As well. yeah, that would be very helpful. Yeah, we can we can figure that out. So okay, we're doing great. So individual interventions. We've assessed. We're looking at our data, we're seeing what's kind of going on, where our areas of need are, where our areas of strength are, and now we're going to intervene. So we're going to work with our folks. The big one across the board is mindfulness-based interventions, right? These increase cognitive capacity and flexibility. They've been around for a while. They're heavily researched. They are kind of like the buzzword intervention of the day. So I'm not going to like overly, you know, beat this, but um, they are strategies to cope with stress, including emotional management. They do in fact find that they reduce perceived stress, anxiety, and symptoms of depression. Generally speaking, when we talk about mindfulness-based interventions, the more informal, the better. So there are, <clears throat> when you do these programs, you can either put up a guided meditation or a guided imagery or read a script, formal, or, you can sit, stand, walk, and guide yourself through some kind of mindfulness-based practice. Those informal practices tend to have more impact on reducing those types of symptoms than your formal. The way that these work is that they are generally six to eight weeks or a week or 24 hours or there's a structured program for mindfulness-based intervention. The research suggests it's a practice, right? Which is not rocket science, it's a practice. You need to continue to use it and have a maintenance program after your initial big chunk. Of course, the big one for mindfulness interventions is MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction. I actually just took an MBSR, the eight-week course out of Massachusetts Hospital, and it was, it was not for me, but it was very good and I learned a lot. It just, it didn't quite resonate, but I will say I learned a, a lot of the mini interventions were fantastic. And the more you have in your tool belt as a practitioner, right, the better you are going to be to assess your patient's needs and strengths. So MBSR includes formal and informal meditation, yoga, and the big piece of the MBSR is the group share. They meet once a week for eight weeks. It's supposed to be a non-judgmental integration of the mind and body and a bringing of awareness to the forefront. And semi-recently, they've also included mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which targets specific psychiatric concerns. Huh. Yeah, it was one that I didn't know about until I signed up for the MBSR and they asked if you wanted the MBSR or the MBCT. So it's a... Um, they work a lot with folks who have depression and anxiety and it's, it's, effic you know, they're doing research about it currently, but they have done prior research and it seems to be a pretty good program. So here's my buddy, um, doing some mindful eating. You can also do some sitting meditation, standing meditation, moving meditation, um, one of the great things that I learned from this MBSR is mindful movement, mindful walking, feeling your body as it moves. I don't know how many people have slowed down to feel each of your muscles as they contract and flex and move as you walk. Highly recommend, very interesting experience. You find muscles and parts of your body that you didn't know and it brings an awareness to the forefront, which I think is really excellent. The body scan, um, right, starting with, generally speaking, your toes and working your way up through your head, bringing awareness to each part of your body. You can do this both by yourself or with a guided um, meditation. And then mindfulness during your activities of daily living. My favorite is when you brush your teeth. Can you be entirely present or as present as possible without passing judgment on yourself while you brush your teeth? 
always a great thing to try. So this is um, our do you have a snack portion of the evening. Oh. We're going to do a little mindful eating. We're not going to do it quite as in depth as um, if you were facilitating in this group. But Suze, you got your coffee. Look at you. Sherry's got something delicious. OK. So take a moment. You can either keep your eyes open or closed. It's entirely up to your comfort zone. If you are going to keep your eyes open, I recommend taking a soft gaze kind of downward. Always works nicely. But first, keep your eyes open and just investigate. Visually take a look at whatever you've got. What does it look like? What textures can you see? What kinds of, does it move potentially? Does it have any ridges or grooves? Is it smooth? And then take a moment and smell your item. What does it smell like? Does it bring any memories to the forefront? Does it make you smile? Does it make you think of something? Does it, you know, what kind of sensations are happening in your body as you investigate this item? The next thing we're gonna do is just take a moment and put the item to your lips without consuming it and bring awareness to that experience. What is that like for you? Are there any temperature changes, any sensations. <laughs> and then bring the item into your mouth. Allow your mouth to experience what that's like without chewing. Can you smell anything? What does that taste like for you? Just bring your body's awareness. And then slowly chew again, bringing awareness to all of the senses in your body. Are you sensing anything out? you know, beyond your mouth? Are there any sensations going on in any other parts of your body as you chew? And then take a breath and enjoy. Oh my goodness. So Cher, my tiny human does not want to go to bed tonight. So if there is crying in this recording, I'm really sorry. Can you Okay, cool. He's really I mean, I can't it turn anyway over my good Girl Scout cookies, so. <laughs> Fabulous. So what was that experience like sharing as much as or as little as you're comfortable with? Oh. It, was it, was, it was a good cup of coffee that I really didn't have very much left for this. <laughs> fair. Very fair. Also, uh, you're very brave. I hope it's decaf. No. No. High octane. <laughs> All right. Um. <laughs> When we did this in my MBSR class, we used raisins. And I realized by going very slowly, I don't actually like raisins. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're in like cookies and cereal and I just eat them. Don't actually like raisins. So hmm. an opportunity to be, become aware of your body and your sensations and to draw your attention away from the worry and the anxiety, right? So, I have no idea if I like raisins. I'm going to have to try that. You might have to try it. Sherry has a very strong opinion. Yeah. I do not strong like opinion. It. Not a fan. It's okay. You get to have that opinion about raisins. I have a cookie, though. I'm you happy. do have a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an app for that, right? So <laughs> mindfulness now is on our, it's in our path, in our pocket, right? So headspace, calm. Thin Velo, Down Dog. Um, and Susie, have you heard of Mindfulness Coach? It's run through the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I don't, yes. Is that what yep. you were? Okay. So that is yet another, another app for that. Okay. Um, there's a whole lot of them. There are. There's a plethora. The only reason I mentioned it on here was because I had never seen something that was specifically run by VA that I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, they've, um, I think within the past year, they've just exploded with the number of apps that we have. That's great. That's awesome. It is. It's really great. And um, Mindfulness Coach was free. Some of these for their premium services are more expensive. I will say, for people who are unemployed, Headspace, the premium version is still 
free. Oh, good. Yeah. It's also free for those of us who have an NPI number. Hmm. Okay. So if you're a provider with an NPI number, it's free. That's cool. That's good to know. Um, a lot of these were free for anybody who was a first responder healthcare provider during the pandemic, but a lot of them have pared that down. So that's all right. MPI numbers. Head state. And New York State also has um, a hotline. Um, if you ever get an email from me at the bottom, there's a COVID hotline that has um, you can talk to somebody at any time. They also have support groups that they do. They start them, I think, at the beginning of the month, and you can go eight week cycle. Um, there's a lot of stuff that New York State is trying to do for anybody, not just New York State employees, but um, it's really actually, it's pretty impressive that they really stepped up to the plate. Um, the OMH and the DOH have both really tried to like help, especially considering in the very beginning, we were the epicenter, you know, New York State was like in it. So right. They, they did a lot and I'm really impressed by that, that they still to this day are sending out links and we have a new, you know, a new um, survey group or we have like, you know, a support group for this, for this, for this, and it's it's free, so. That's awesome, good. Yeah. So they're, they are doing interventions, which is awesome. Yeah. I think Sherry, at the end, I have the New York State, new, the right. website up there. I'll look on my email and see if I can, I'll type the number in the, in the Perfect. Chat. Perfect. Okay, so when we talk about organizational interventions, one size doesn't fit all, right? All of our all of our organizations are pretty unique, just like we are. However, some consistencies, early delivery. So if you are talking about a specific traumatic event that has impacted your agency-wide organization, you want to do something between two and 30 days from the point of incident. So the sooner the better, but no more than 30 days to get positive results. It needs to be geared towards the character of your population. So not only your patients, but also your staff. What's the culture like? How do you make this fit within your system? And it needs to come from within. You can't hire Joe Schmo, you know, organization intervention guy and expect that it's going to function. People are going to put up boundaries that person has not experienced what we have experienced we're not doing that but it also needs to be supported by your management both in the participation of the creation and then the training and keeping eyes on the ground is particularly your middle managers who can see both down and up and make those connections right that's me that's you you're very integral to this yeah. whole system and i actually started doing uh we can't call it Zumba because I'm not a licensed Zumba instructor anymore, but I've been doing Shake the Stress Away every Wednesday. Um, haven't done it in a few months because we had the COVID outbreak, but it was only for staff to come for a half an hour just to kind of dance their stress away. I would come to that. That sounds lovely. Yeah, it was it was really good, actually. You know, we had a really good turnout, so I was very impressed by it. Nice. And I imagine, right, it was internally organized. It was supported by the management because management's you, yeah. right? And it fits the population that you work with perfectly. Exactly. So I, I love it. Oh, good. It yeah. also <laughs> should, should harness existing social processes. So don't reinvent the wheel, right? So do you have a staff meeting every month? Do you have a staff lounge where you can make things available or you can crash lunch and provide some kind of intervention? Don't make it more complicated than it has to be. And in this case, the more specific you get, the better. General programming has a place. Things like nonspecific debriefing, psychological first aid, they're not bad things. They're just not as effective as a specifically geared intervention. So there are a couple that are um, fairly well used and they're used and modified for um, different organizations. This is the CISD critical in, um, incident stress debriefing. This is um, one that's done by a trained professional and it's a seven step debriefing guide. Eh, it's got questionable efficacy, I think in large part because they tried to move it between agencies and well, uh, see, see the last slide, that doesn't always work. This is the TRIM, the Trauma Risk Management Program. It's peer led, so it comes from within. 
there are two interviews, the first at about 72 hours post exposure, and then one month after, particularly going through a script, looking for red flags, looking for ways that they can refer to services to get person support in the way that they need to and in a way that is person centered. This is more, um, more um, reliable. And then we've got SMART. This one came up all over the place on the internet. I had never heard of it before, but it's the Stress Management and Resiliency Training Program. It's at a lot of different agencies. It is offered as a training through a couple of different programs. Um, and it's essentially, it builds resilience, which we talked about is definitely a way to combat at the forefront um, compassion fatigue. And it's eight sessions trained by, um, or led by a trained facilitator who can be a member of your team. The one that we use at my agency is called PACT. It's the Provider Associate Care Team. It's a peer-led referral program. We're actually looking at expanding the program. Right now we have maybe, like, I think I'm the only PACT member on my unit. The rehab unit has like 12 because it's, they're much more connected that way, I guess. Um, and so we're trying to find a way to space those out so that they're more available. The way the PACT works is it is both formal and informal. So if there is a critical incident, managers can refer to your PAC team leader who will then in, you know, chat with you, do some empathetic listening, and then refer to the next service mm -hmm. if they think you need something. And then what happens nine times out of 10 is that you walk into a room and somebody starts talking to you. And then you go, oh, maybe we need to go take a walk into my office. Let's actually talk about this, um, which that's just how humanity works, right? Like you start having a conversation and then somebody needs a little bit more support, mm -hmm. which is something I like about PACT is that it's very realistic in how things happen. And there's no, like, you know, you just, you do your empathetic listening and then they've given the onus to the facilitator to make the decision about what and how that person needs additional services, which I think is really nice. It's not canned. So this is our BAH Medical Center. It's our right from before. What kinds of interventions? They need an intervention, y'all. They need some support. So how are we gonna support them? What are we doing for them? I would definitely do something with mindfulness, especially <laughs> with these long days, they're gonna need some kind of refreshing or some kind of refocusing, you know, when you hit hour seven or eight, you're like, uh, so perhaps it could be midday as opposed to, you know, beginning or end. Yes, I hit the 2.30. 2.30 uh -huh. is my like, uh -huh. I'm looking for that piece of chocolate, second cup of coffee. Yeah, maybe a little mindfulness is what I really need. Yeah, right? but the chocolate oh. is too. <laughs> yeah, so it's good too, but maybe, um, you know, they only have their managers touch base once or twice a year. They need a little more than that. Yeah. Uh, no matter if it's an entry level professional or somebody that's that's been around for a little more. Um, they need they need some time, some face time with their manager. Um, whether it's for training or for support, they need more than just a yearly picnic. Um, also, and it's, it says staff are trained once a year with few approvals for additional education. So that extra continuing education or extra certifications or, you know, those programs, those like ASAPs and the TRTs and all that kind of stuff, that might be what they would need in order to kind of bridge that gap where yeah. two of them would feel empowered by taking these extra trainings to support each other. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. They need they need more than what they're getting. And then you find a way to function that towards meeting the goals, right? So not only are you getting your CEUs, but also use them for, for the power of good, right? Right. Absolutely. One of the social workers um, in behavioral health leads um, Mindful Monday Moments. And um, 
you know, it's uh, it's 15 minutes and you can log in, you can, you used to be able to show up in person, you can call in, you know, you can connect however, however is most easy, you know, whatever is most um, convenient for you. And, you know, just take those five, 10, 15 minutes to just recenter yeah. yourself and, and then power on for the rest of the day or not. Right. What one of my favorite things from the mindfulness program was what's called for next? What's called for next? Whether that's professionally or personally, right? Sometimes we get stuck in the middle of our day and we have been head down rushing through program to program and client to client and you feel like your your head's spinning, right? Mm -hmm. What's called for next? Do I need a piece of chocolate? Do I need a mindfulness moment? Do I need to be done for the day within reason? Do I need to transition to my notes? Do I, right? What's called for next? I, like I think that. it's brilliant. Um, so what's called for next for BAH is more training, more face-to-face -face with their managers, right? How are their managers supposed to be able to provide any kind of meaningful anti-compassion fatigue training or support if they're not present, right? This picnic once a year, I what I should have written was they get a pizza party once a year because I think that might feel a little bit more applicable to us in the healthcare field. Yeah. Right, congratulations, yep. you get a pizza Or bagels. Party. Ooh, bagels. Oh yeah, been, been to the bagel party. Uh, we got hats. Yeah, we did too, we got goggles too. Oh. Hey, face shields. <laughs> I was gonna say those are standard issue now. You don't have a choice. We're Seriously. gonna get you them, but you don't get to wear. You don't get a choice. Yeah. Um, but BAH Medical Center, they clearly need to make a paradigm shift here, right? It sounds like they have a great program. Their census is pretty low, for good or for ill. Maybe there's a reason their census is low. Maybe their staff are so you know burnt that they need a, such a low census to be able to do what they need to do. Yeah. So definitely more training, more support, more option. You know, it sounds like their schedules are kind of all over the place. Maybe they need to look at finding more consistency and routine in their day. Four mm -hmm. tens are great, but maybe you need to do an evening shift and a night shift and everybody stays on the same schedule, right? None of this rotating. Yeah. Um, this overnight on call, do you have two dedicated staff, three dedicated staff that love overnights and that needs to be their jam, yep. yeah. right? And they have this great staff room. So what are we doing with the staff room? Can we find some way to creatively create a space that provides education and training or provides a more Zen area, finding moments for mindfulness in their room? Um, this is, related. So Lynn and a woman just did this spirituality session at conference, right? And they talked about your environment and how your aesthetic environment really impacts your area, right? So maybe they need to feng shui and look at what's going to serve them in their space to create a more, you know, copacetic area. Okay. Any other thoughts about BAH? Okay, okay cool. All right. So paradigm shift time. We need to go from sad Ted to happy Ted. <laughs> we need to go from, we don't have a problem and we have no money to this for this and we have no time for this. to understanding that traumatized systems cannot be the status quo. They can't, we're not gonna have any employees left if that's the case. It's gonna cost us more in the long run because of high turnover than it is to invest and support our current employees. We have to find a way to create time. So my challenge to you as support people who have been in your field for a long time is to work with above and below to find a way to create time at our agency. And it's just, I'm struggling with it. I have challenged myself to the same challenge and I'm struggling with it. But I think the only way to keep people in the field as if we support them, and we're not going to support them if they have compassion fatigue. So we got to work together on it. 
Okay. Here are my resources. All of your agencies have an EAP, an Employee Assistant Program, newyorkprojecthope.org, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, the Crisis Text Line, um, which is the text line for New York specifically, and the Frontline um, Worker Text Line is there too. Always good to know your resources. I'm also, even though we don't need to um, for our conversation, I am gonna just go through the references just so they're up on the camera. Mm -hmm. That way, if anybody needs to pause it to look at references later, they can. Fabulous. Any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, feelings, or opinions? This was great. I think it Excellent. was really special, and I took a lot out of it that I'm going to now bring back to my powers that be and see what we can do to keep motivating our staff to keep moving forward. Fabulous. I know it's a heavy topic. I know a lot of it is not you know it's something that's still very close to us and that we're still kind of living so thank you for bearing with me i hope that there's hope for the, i know that there's hope for the future and that we just have to keep working together and finding ways to make impacts in our community which we definitely can do and we're going to do it together yeah. yes we can absolutely fabulous all right i think i think that's it how do we do on time we did perfectly on time, actually, because it is 9.01. Wow. Good job, everyone. All right. I'm going to pause the recording.